Hey, thanks for joining me on this journey uh, through looking at the some of the main elements of the coming of the king. That, of course, the king is Jesus Christ, and his coming has two parts to it. One is invisible, and only believers will see that. That's the rapture. And then two, there's the second coming. With Within the boundaries of those two things is the tribulation period. Uh, the first three and a half years, there's uh, not so bad. There's a peace treaty with Israel and so forth that we haven't gotten into, but we'll eventually, and so forth and so on. And, and the world leader comes to power, and, and he, de he is actually the world leader for the last three and a half years uh, of the tribulation period, which is commonly referred to as the Great Tribulation. And then you have the second, his reign is put to an end by the second coming of Christ. And then you have the millennial reign, and then you have the final conflict. Then you have the new heaven and new earth that is created. And so we are focusing on main events, not every detail, but certainly the main events and main characters. Of course, the main character is Jesus himself. Um, the one that people are most prominent, are prominent in people's minds, however, it would be the Antichrist, and John's the only one who refers to him as the Antichrist. He's typically referred to as the man of lawlessness, the man of destruction, the, the man who sets up abomination. There are several different names that he goes by, but most people recognize Antichrist. And we are looking at uh, Revelation chapter 13 because that is where you go to find that, verses 1 through uh, 10. That's where you go to find, and also other places in Revelation uh, 17 as well, and also Daniel chapter 7, uh, you find all of this that is there. Uh, and we looked yesterday at his arrival, and he's empowered by Satan. He's a charismatic figure. Um, the dragon, Satan, gives him his power and his throne and great authority. And so this is a unholy trinity. You have Satan who represents the Father. You have um, this political leader who represents uh, Jesus, and you have this religious leader, this false prophet who represents the Holy Spirit. Uh, so you have not three in one, but three individuals, um, not a triunity, not a sharing of essence. Uh, these are two people who are dominated by Satan, and well as the satanic figure or the Satan, uh, the deceiver, the enemy, however you want to term him, the devil, you know, whatever term you're comfortable with. All of those are biblical terms for him. Uh, and today we're looking at uh, verses 3 through 6. And so let's read uh, verses 1 through 3, I mean 2, and then we'll look at verses 3 through 6. And he stood on the sand of the seashore, Satan did. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns, seven heads, and on its horns were ten diadems, those are crowns, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne, his great authority. Now remember, it's describing a form of government, but it's also describing the world leader himself, because the two are inextricably bound together, uh, and one reflects the other. And then we move to uh, verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war with him? And so we'll stop there for a second. And, say, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and a fatal wound was healed. There are some who would say, well, this is an imitation uh, just as Jesus was raised from the dead. So this uh, this false figure, this counterfeit king is going to be raised from the dead. But that would mean that Satan raised him from the dead, and Satan doesn't have that power to do that. Only God has the power to do that, and he's given that over to the Son. So what my belief is, that's an impossibility. What my belief is that this will be a counterfeit. This will be an imitation resurrection. He will appear to have been killed. He will come back, miraculously come back to life, although it'll be a fraud, it'll be a sham, it'll be a lie. Second Thessalonians refers to that, that people will be deceived and they will follow a lie. And this is the great lie that they will follow. And they will say, wow, this is the figure. And I can't help but think of what Hitler was trying to accomplish 
of what everyone has tried to accomplish and establishing a world government uh, like an empire and how Hitler's um, Nazi Germany took on the looks, the buildings, the arches and so forth, took on the form of the Roman Empire. Uh, and there's going to be a resurrection, although it's not really a resurrection because the Roman Empire just fell apart. It's still alive in the European countries. Uh, it just fell into disarray. It never, it, it, it never died. And it, it's going to come back to, it's going to be revived, in other words, and come back to life. Uh, and it's going to be a grand and glorious empire like that that we're going to see. And so it's going to be all based upon the, the following of the world on this, this charismatic world leader who, who brokers this deal with Israel to bring peace. And he's going to be signs and wonders because Satan is behind it, giving authority and power. And there's going to just be all these miraculous signs and all of that. So if you're, hey, listen, if your faith is based on signs and wonders, uh, the devil can do signs and wonders as well. Um, your, your faith better rest in Jesus Christ, uh, the person of Jesus Christ. And so uh, signs and wonders need to be tested against the word of God. Is this something God would do? Is this, is this something? This evil man is not going to be resurrected. God is going to resurrect evil men. Jesus is going to do that. Uh, at the end of the age, but this guy has got a false resurrection. He's going to appear to be resurrected, uh, but it's all a scam. It's all a lie, and the people are going to proclaim, oh, look, look at what our Savior, look, he's, he's done it all. Oh, the Bible claimed that this guy did that, but that was just a myth. Now we see it with our eyes, and we've seen it on television, and it's being on the Internet. It's everywhere, and it's being uh, being copied over and on tweets and so on Twitter and, and, and uh, TikTok and all of this, and everybody's sharing it and well, whatever else they'll have at that time news reports of how he came back to life and oh it must be true oh this wonderful thing and and it will just be dazzled the world would just be dazzled by this guy and he's really cruel and wicked and being uh, empowered by satan himself and they worship the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast so this is something that Satan's always coveted. He's always wanted the worship that belongs to God. And people are finally going to be worshiping him openly, openly worshiping Satan and worshiping the beast and all of this that goes with it. And uh, they won't worship the truth, but they will worship a lie. And they'll follow after the lie. And they say, who is like the beast and who is able to come against him? Not even Jesus, that so-called Christ, that so-called Messiah that those Bible thumpers, that those preachers talked about. Oh, my goodness, I'm so glad they're gone. Oh, the golden age we're living in. Oh, how marvelous it is and how wonderful he, Jesus couldn't bring peace to the Middle East. But look, the temple is being rebuilt and there's peace and prosperity and everybody's doing great. And he's solved these world problems and these weather problems and these uh, th these, these plague problems and all of that. Oh, he's got all the answers and he's marvelous and wonderful. And who can come against him? And there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. Uh, he's going to speak. And it, it, it is that the whole regime, the whole, uh, the whole empire is arrogant. The whole empire, he's, he, of course, since he's empowered by Satan and has the authority of Satan, of course he's arrogant. Satan is arrogant. Uh, and he has this arrogance about him, as do many modern-day politicians, by the way, have this arrogance about them that they are better than everybody else and they are superior to everybody else, and he will blaspheme the one true God. Everything about that confederation of states before it becomes an empire uh, will be blasphemous. It will be God-rejecting, and it will be promoting that which blasphemes. We will be promoting lifestyles that blaspheme righteousness and holiness uh, and that repudiate uh, righteous living. And uh, in fact, he's going to punish those things as, as we'll see later on. Uh, but he, he can only act for 42 months. Well, that's three and a half years. It's been given to him. Given to him by whom? God. God puts a limit on that. God is in charge of all this. <clears throat> he allows it but he puts limits on it. And Jesus said, if it had not been limited, no flesh could survive it for 42 months. And I think that 42 months is going to be the great tribulation period. That last three and a half years 
that he is going to reign as the Antichrist. I think he's going to be alive. He's going to be involved in government. He will be there, the Ten Confederates of Kings, uh, and he is going to rise to prominence in the midst of all that. He doesn't become the world ruler until after this fake resurrection event, and then he has authority for that last three and a half years, uh, and the second coming of Christ puts an end to his reign. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is those who dwell in heaven. So he blasphemes everything about God, um, defames it, and the world will follow him. The world will follow a lie, but it will not follow the truth. It's amazing, isn't it? And that's what's going to happen. That's what's coming, and God allows that to shut the mouth of Satan. And, of course, the tribulation period is all about the refining of Israel, drawing Israel to God through faith in Jesus, accepting their Messiah as a whole, not every individual Jew, but as a whole, the nation of Israel will turn to God through faith in Jesus. And it is a, it is a condemnation, a putting right of all wickedness and God rejecting nations. Uh, there will be people saved throughout this. There, there's the righteous remnant of Israel, the 144,000 that we'll talk about, uh, all of that, that we will see. Uh, but all of it, behind all of it, uh, you must see the love of God. You must see the justice of God, the righteousness of God, its faithfulness to his word, to his promises, to put things right. And that um, this must be this way uh, because people just simply reject the truth and accept a lie that refuse the love of God. And so the flip side of that is the wrath of God. And of course, God is wrathful against that which destroys and contaminates his good creation, uh, sin and death and godlessness and rejecting him. So yeah, you, you have that and you'll see that as we go through. And we'll flesh this out some more as we move along. But we're going to be talking about this uh, throughout this week, talking about the Antichrist, who this figure is, and uh, not literally who he is, but where he comes from, what he does, and that kind of thing. And then we'll be talking about the other uh, person of the unholy trinity, and that is the false prophet. So we have a counterfeit king, and we've got a false uh, prophet or, uh, that we'll get to uh, next week. So I pray that you, you see behind this the love of God, his, his faithfulness to his covenant promise, the promise to all humanity back in chapter 3 of Genesis that one would uniquely be born who would put things right, who would destroy evil. And this is being done um, through Jesus Christ. And so I pray that you know the love of God through Jesus Christ because he loves you so much he gave his son Jesus. You might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here and right now. And I pray that that is yours because if it is, then you know the peace of God um, because that's what we were called to, to know his peace, his wholeness, completeness, um, lacking nothing. And I pray that that's yours. I pray that you have that joy as well because that, that certainty that God is in control and he's working things out. I pray that that's yours in the midst of the chaos of the age in which we live as the world stage is being set, as shadows are being cast, uh, as I heard David Jeremiah say, shadows that are cast backward the future casts its shadow backward and we we were seeing the stage of the world being set for all of these events of prophecy to be fulfilled i believe we're seeing that today um now i'm not saying it's five years ten years next week i'm not saying that i'm just saying it doesn't take place that that we see in revelation or that we see in the new testament does not take place in a vacuum it doesn't happen overnight there are things that lead up to the stage being set for this to take place. And I can easily see how these things could happen um, even now. Uh, I think there's more that has to take place before the stage is set, but we are moving rapidly in that direction quicker than I thought it would take place. Uh, and I think it's going to pick up speed. If we don't see a revival here, it's going to pick up speed. Uh, so I pray for you, my friend. I pray that you know the love of God, the salvation of God, the joy of God and the peace of God that are only found through Jesus Christ as Lord, yielding to him as Lord, and then by that act, receiving his salvation. I pray that you know that. Hey, listen, I pray that God's blessings, his shalom, his peace rest upon you always. Till tomorrow, God bless you.